Hey, Ryan, we have some pretty exciting news, I think. Construction Disruption now has our first ever paid sponsor. There's this company that approached us about getting in front of our audience, and we're so pleased to have them now as a sponsor. That's right, Todd. That company is True Look, and what they offer is pretty awesome. They've made it incredibly easy to view, secure, and document job sites with their construction cameras. You know, a lot of times I think we think of construction cameras as, you know, just being there for security. But with True Look, they also have features like custom time-lapse videos and remote live viewing. Yeah, you know, a term we throw around a lot here on construction disruption is game-changing, and True Look certainly falls into that category. Um, being able to document your progress on job sites and then go back and show your clients that high quality in progress video is certainly something that I would call game changing. You know, I absolutely agree. And at True Look, they also have unlimited users, free forever media storage, 24 seven support, no contract service plans, lifetime equipment warranties, and no limits on 4G LTE data transmission. And they integrate seamlessly with project management tools like Procore and Autodesk. You know, I don't think anyone makes construction cameras as hassle-free or feature-rich as TrueLook. Anyone can go and schedule a free, no-obligation quote at TrueLook.com. That's TrueLook.com. Welcome to the Construction Disruption Podcast, where we uncover the future of design, building, and remodeling. I'm Todd Miller of Isaiah Industries, manufacturer of specialty metal roofing and other building materials. Today, my co-host is Ethan Young. Ethan, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good today, Todd. Looking forward to the holiday. How are you doing? Yeah, that's true. We are recording this right before the 4th of July. So, uh, yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to at least a few days to chill and watch my favorite Reds team. Man, yeah. they're tearing it up lately. <laughs> Hopefully, they can keep that up. We'll see. Yeah. So... Looking at our guest today, Ethan, um, based on your age, I guess you may have been a Thomas the Train fan at one time. Am I right on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I definitely remember having a bunch of Thomas the Train, all the different trains when I was a kid. And we actually went to visit. I guess there was like a full-scale Thomas the Train or whatever. I don't remember where it was, but I have a memory oh. of going there as a kid to see it, yeah. I remember that. I think it was in Indiana or Southern Ohio yeah. or something. Yeah, I think I think our family visited there too. I think my <laughs> mom just sold all the Thomas the Train stuff from when I was a kid, like a year or two ago. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep, definitely a big fan. We gave ours to somebody. I don't remember who it was. Well, um, pretty interesting though. I think all you kids kind of grew up at that age, thinking, oh, "I'm going to build a railway someday," and I don't really, really remember so each of the characters they had different characters and personalities yeah, and yeah. i only remember a couple of them but yeah and actually when we were talking about this before the episode um the movie bullet train came up because one of the characters in that his whole thing is about thomas the train and like how different people's personalities fit into those characters or whatever so i only remember a couple of the names but if you're if you want to know more thomas the train stuff go watch that movie <laughs> <laughs> good deal there had to be a Percy. Was there a Percy? Yeah, there's, there's Percy, there's Percy, Toby, yeah. there's a Diesel. Uh, um, yeah, well, I think Harold sense. is the helicopter. That's all, <laughs> that's all I really remember, though. <laughs> well, good deal. So for those out there who grew up wanting to build a railway, today our guest is someone who did just that, believe it or not. He built a railway. Um, folks like this don't come along every day, so I'm pretty excited to talk to him and uh, learn about what they've done and find out more about their plans for the future. Um, plus, really is kind of bonus content that's pretty exciting. Um, we're going to dig into a specific problem they had along the way. Uh, and that problem was sourcing American-made construction products for their project. And so we're going to look at a way in which uh, they are working to solve that problem for other companies. So uh, today's guest is Brian Kronberg. Uh, Brian is Vice President of Development for Brightline Trains, and he is also the founder of Amerified. Brian, welcome to Construction Disruption. 
Thank you very much for having me, Todd and Ethan. I'm, I'm very excited to be here today. Well, we're glad to have you. So your career started, I believe, um, as a project manager for a leading commercial real estate firm uh, in South Florida or southeastern Florida. Um, I'm curious, how did this all happen? How did you get where you are today? Did you just suddenly wake up one day and uh, along with a few others decide that Florida really needed a high speed private um, passenger train system, or uh, tell us kind of about the needs and the dreams um, that you developed that resulted in the development of Brightline Trains. Sure. Uh, so it's a, a bit of a, a windy road. No one comes out of college thinking that they were going to go build trains and, and train <laughs> stations. <not. laughs> um, and neither did I. I got out, graduated college and expected and, and had a job opportunity to go to New York and work with one of the banks. Um, and I was planning on doing that. I got home back to Miami after finishing college. Uh, the Miami Heat had just won the, the championship with oh, yeah. Shaquille O'Neal, Dwayne Wade, Gary Payton. I decided to go to the championship parade in downtown Miami, saw the team that the Heat had built and being a huge Heat fan. And the change in skyline of Miami, there was a lot of new construction and the skyline was just changing. And I, I felt like something special was happening in, in Miami. And I was always interested in real estate and architecture and figured, you know what, I didn't want to go to New York and, and work in the banking industry that I would um, pursue a, an op, uh, opportunity in real estate. So I got an entry-level job working for one of the, the top commercial real estate companies in Miami. And the first part of my career was really developing uh, business parks, industrial business parks for that matter. So large-scale warehouses, about 200,000 square feet. Then we would lease them to companies and then ultimately sell the buildings. Um, after many years of doing that, I took a, a rare vacation with some friends out to Spain. This was before I was married and had kids and got a call. They tracked me down in Spain and said, you know what, when, when you get back, we're going to pursue train service along mm -hmm. the passenger corridor that was once um, owned by and established by Henry Flagler. So consider that what you'll be doing when, when you get back home. I had no idea where the call was coming from or we hadn't talked about it before, but was anxious to get back. And sure enough, it was the vision of uh, a gentleman and the founder who still uh, is involved today, a gentleman by Wes Edens, who saw the, the need and had the foresight to put passenger rail back on this corridor that runs through the downtowns of Miami, Fort Lauderdale, all the way up to Jacksonville. So they said, we're going to do it. And there was no playbook for us to follow. It was just, just a few people sitting in a room trying to map out what the next steps would be. And that's how we got started. And the rest is history. That's really interesting. And I wanted to ask, too, because I know, obviously, America has a pretty rich history with passenger freight back in the day. Obviously, we don't really do it as much anymore. We still have a lot of, or not passenger freight, passenger trains. We still have a lot of freight trains today. But... What kind of spurred the idea to do specifically like a passenger train through Florida? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, the uh, Florida was was a growing state, and this was back in 2011, 12, when when we really uh, initiated the the company. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what was going to happen to Florida since from what's happened from back then to now was just the the number of people moving to Florida and the population growth. Mm -hmm. But Florida is so narrow and there's only so much room for highways and yeah. more and more people were coming. The railway was already there and we had the rights to, to run the freight service and we said, we'll give it a shot. We were, the city pairs that we were connecting were Miami and Orlando, which are two of the most visited cities in the United States. And it's also a distance that we say is too long to drive, but too short to fly. Mm -hmm. So the the amount of time that it would take you to get on a, go to the airport, go through security, board your plane, get off the plane in Orlando. We said we can do it faster than flying, faster than driving, and it's far safer. The roads down here are, are dangerous. 
congested, and this was an alternate mode of transportation that, that we saw the need for. I'm, I'm curious, as you suddenly branched into this and you come back from Spain and you're trying to help figure this all out, um, did you folks look at other passenger railway systems, perhaps in other countries, or were there some things you used as a model in trying to figure this all out? Yeah, um, so we absolutely did that. We had a good idea of what we wanted the system to be in terms of brand attributes. We wanted it to be a hospitality-focused Mm. system where where people were treated differently or, or felt differently getting on our system as compared to a another type of public transportation or what sometimes people perceive as public transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, so we knew that, but we also knew that this existed in, in other parts of the world. So we looked at London, Paris, Rome, Milan, and, and other examples that were were well respected and and profitable. And we, we took the lessons learned there and put it into Brightline, and, and that's how we got started. Um, we also, the other thing we did is we wanted to find the right team with, with architects, engineers, and, and contractors to help us build this. Not having any experience in train stations, but knowing that we wanted a signature stations. It was going on Google, typing in top 10 architects in the United States and cold calling architecture firms, seeing if they'd come down for, for a meeting with us. And some of them said yes, others didn't know what we were talking about and said, too busy, thank you very much. So <laughs> grateful to, to the firms that, that took our call and we've, we've been working with them. So how many actual stations did you have to design and build then? I really hadn't even thought through that part of all this. Yeah, so the, the initial system that we launched in 2018 was three stations, one in Miami, one in Fort Lauderdale, and one in West Palm, West Palm Beach. And we have our signature, the other signature station is in Orlando at the Orlando International Airport. That one will open uh, within a few months. Maybe by the time that, that this episode airs, it, it might be already open. And in addition, we added uh, two more stations in a city called Boca Raton and then Aventura. So in total, there will be six stations by the end of this year. Wow, that, that is an accomplishment. So, you know, you folks are the only privately owned and operated, you know, inner city passenger rail, railroad in the country. Um, kind of curious, I mean, what, who are your commuters who are your users are are you getting a lot of tourists who are utilizing your service or is it mainly work commuters or you know and do you anticipate that changing with the opening up of orlando it seems like that potentially could shift a little bit yeah absolutely we're right now we're fortunate to have a variety of different users we have uh, regulars that use it every day to get to and from work that don't want to be driving on the I-95 congested highways that every day the traffic is, is worse and worse. Um, we have people that choose to come to Miami Heat and Marlin Games from up north, whether it be West Palm Beach or Aventura, and you don't need to deal with downtown Miami traffic or pay the fees for parking, which sometimes for, for these big games is, is quite high. And then we also have the, the tourists that are coming in to Miami. And before they were likely just coming to Miami and staying in Miami, but now we have, they have the opportunity to easily, more easily see these other cities that, that they really didn't have easy access or exposure to. Um, so that's the, the combination now. And then certainly when we go to Orlando, the, the um, tourism market will open up far more. And again, that's, those are areas where people flying into Orlando, they, they go to Orlando or they go to Miami. They're not really visiting both. So with the introduction of Brightline connecting Miami to Orlando, we'll be able to get visitors that, that are able to visit both cities. So how far would that ride from Miami to Orlando take? Uh, on uh, Brightline? It's, it's about three hours. Okay. Well, that's not, not bad at all. So so, Brian, tell us a little bit about, you know, where you folks are in terms of, uh, you know, your overall growth strategy. I mean, once Orlando is in place, I mean, does that fulfill it or 
<clears throat> are you thinking even other areas of the country at some point or yeah so step one is is get orlando open which which will happen um imminently and from there there are other cities that we're looking at within florida we haven't announced where because when once we announce it becomes far harder to to if we need land sure. to assemble the land or, or access the land but we likely will do um, additional stations in, in Florida. And then also our company is also pursuing Las Vegas to Los Angeles. So I okay. don't personally work on that, but our company does and they've been in design and that construction should start soon as well. So we'll connect LA to Vegas and then who knows, uh, there might be other city pairs within the country where that, that market exists again too long to drive, but too short to fly. So those are the those are the areas that we'll focus on, and there might be one or two other ones within the country. Well, that LA to Vegas route sounds, sounds ideal. I mean, that that's it just sounds pleasant. That sounds like a cool way to go between the two cities. And you know, it's interesting as I as I think about. It, I mean, ever since I was a kid, we always heard you know passenger railways are going to have to be more the United States future and they're very common in other countries and all that type of stuff and you know for many years this predates me believe it or not Ethan um you know back in like the 20s 30s 40s there was I think called an inner urban train that even ran between several uh towns or cities here in Ohio um that would bring commuters back and forth and so forth and so you know it just seems like a very natural thing to do. And, you know, it seems like it kind of ebbs and flows. I mean, you have a little bit of inflation and the price of gas goes up and everyone's looking for mass transit and other ways uh, of getting places. I mean, is that part of your thought process too? Just kind of looking at, hey, how do we how do we be more green in, in the way that we live? How do we be more efficient? Um, t- tell us a little bit, too, about your trains. I mean, can people, are there, is there Wi-Fi? Can people do work on the trains if they're commuting? Yeah, yes to everything that, that you just mm-hmm. said. Uh, I mean, our tr- we were green, sustainable, safe. And mm-hmm. yes, you could you could work. We have Wi-Fi on the trains. We're actually the first train in the United States that's fully ADA accessible. So you could take a, a wheelchair from within the station all the way uh, onto the train. And then once you're on the train, you could navigate uh, the wheelchair throughout the whole, um, all the different uh, coaches throughout. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we're really proud of what we've been able to design and, and build and put into service. The other feature that, that you hear everyone talking about it are the restrooms on the trains. They're not at all what you would expect out of a train, and it's all touchless. You could go in there, and you don't want to get out of there. It's so nice in there. Well, I remember several years ago, uh, I was in Japan and, and rode the bullet train a few times. I mean, is it an experience similar to that, probably, or...? Yeah, I, we're we're not going nearly as fast as they're able to go right. in, in Japan because we're crossing through the downtowns, but the the overall experience, absolutely, very cool. So I already clued our audience into the fact that you know you one of your challenges through all this was sourcing American-made construction materials. But before we dig into that, um, I'm kind of curious: what are some of the other surprising challenges uh, that? one runs into as they attempt to build a railway. Um, it just seems like such a huge undertaking. Yeah, it's an undertaking and you gotta be cavalier about it. Um, but essentially the way that I explain it or when, when you start out, there's a whole checklist of things that you needed to be able to accomplish. And there are thousands of, upon thousands of items, but the big categories I would say are, you need to have the nece- uh, land the mm-hmm. necessary land to connect the the stations and have the, the corridor. You need to have the funding in place, enough money. These are quite capital intensive. And then you need to have the government approvals. And there's a whole subset of items underneath that, but you need to be able to, to get every one of them done. If you don't get one of those three buckets, there's, there are no, there's no project and these, these projects uh, frequently 
don't make it as as we've been able to do because they've run into uh, challenges with with any of the, any and all of those three. Um, so those are those are the big things. We at the onset we did not own all the land that we needed to connect Miami to Orlando, and there's a lot of small small parcels that we had to go out and looked at a map, figured out what parcels, what's the track path going to take and overlay that onto property maps, figure out who owns the land and go meet with the landowners. And you you need everyone to agree to sell you the land. And if you're able to get that, you've crossed one big hurdle only to encounter the next surprise, but you don't know what that is until you're, you're in it. Until you get that far. Yeah. Perseverance. And uh, we've got a great team that kind of just knocked through walls to make sure that we were able to get everything that we needed done. So what was that time period from, you know, the time you first said, let's do this to the time that your first train was running and you had your first passenger? Uh, Really 2011 was when we started. And then 2018 is when we had our first passenger, which is extremely fast. That that period of seven years of states and, and countries spend that long studying projects. And we were able to arrive at the concept design it, get it funded, build it, and put it into operations in that short of a time span. Wow. Is there anyone else doing this in other areas of the U.S. that you're aware of uh, working on on privately owned rail? There's there's a project in, in Texas. I haven't followed it too closely, so I'm not sure where where they're at okay. and, and their process, but um, connecting some of the, the major cities in Texas. Interesting. Yeah, those can be some long drives across uh, between the major cities in Texas. So yep. I can see benefit to that too. Sure. So let's dig into the difficulty that you ran into finding U.S. made products to use in your construction. Um, well, first of all, let me ask this. Why was using U.S.A. made products important to you? And, and, you know, how big of a challenge did it end up being? Well, y- using U.S. made products is always a, a priority for, for us at Brightline when when we're able. But it was a little different when we recently uh, were awarded a federal grant by the Federal Railroad Administration uh, called a Chrissy Grant. And along with the city of Boca for our Boca Raton project, it was a partnership and between the FRA, Brightline, and the city of Boca. And whenever you take a federal grant, at least through DOT, it comes with the requirement to comply with Buy America, which is, um, it's been around for for a while. And recently with the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, it's getting a lot of attention. But our the requirement for our BOCA station came with this Buy America because of the federal grant that we took. Interesting. So that led you uh, to the development of something called AmeriFied. Um, Tell us, tell our audience a little bit about what Amerified is and uh, what you're accomplishing through it. Sure. So uh, Amerified is a, a company that I started. In. I consider myself a third shift entrepreneur after I <laughs> took care of the, with the family, my job with Brightline. Uh, when when all that is is done and I'm able to spend some time with with a few others, we work on Amerified and Amerified is really an online database that I wanted to create to promote U.S. manufacturing and avoid the, the challenges that I had, which were sitting in owner, architect, contractor meetings, trying to find products that comply. And we're all on, on the internet, on Google, making phone calls, spending a unnecessary, enormous amount of time trying to source certain products that will comply. And I thought for something that as many people are actively doing with existing plus the infrastructure act which is an additional 1.2 trillion dollars that the federal government is putting into the economy there needs to be a an easy button as i call it for sourcing and finding u.s products and i called department of transportation and tried to do my research to see if this existed and it it didn't and i said i'm going to do it or give it a shot they said go for it. Good luck. It'd be a great resource if it existed. So a team of us spent many hours, weekends, nights, trying to map out how this would work. And fast forward to, to now, we've 
were able to launch the site about a month ago, and the the activity and, and interest has been tremendous so far. Well, I certainly applaud you. What what you're doing through that. And I know you and I have talked a little bit about it and you, know, you invited us to submit our products for it, which I'm almost there. I'm, I'm going to get those to you here real soon. I'm excited to be a part of it and uh, love the platform uh, that you've developed. And I'm kind of curious, you know, you mentioned, you know, here we are Googling and trying to find these products. Did you ever run into situations where, you know, you'd have a lead on a product and you'd think, surely this is USA made. And, you know, then you'd get Get to a certain point and find out. Oh, doggone it! It's not after all. Yeah, all too all too often, and and to make matters a little bit worse, the government has set up. They have Buy America, but they also have something called Buy American that has an N on the end. So it just makes it that much more confusing. And the level of domestic manufacturing between Buy America and Buy American is different. And you talk to someone on the phone and you say, we're looking for products that are made in, in America and comply with by America. And they say, yep, we have it. Yeah, you go down the road with someone, you agree on price, you, you send them the certificate, ask them to sign it. And they say, oh, sorry, we're, we're by American, not by America. And then, so you've just wasted all that time and then you need to restart the process and go through everything that that um, all the time that you spent, you need to spend it again. Wow. Yeah, that'd have to be frustrating, yeah. goodness. So tell us, you know, how can someone tap into the Amerify database, either um, as a user, you know, an architect or a specifier trying to look for products, or uh, as someone, you know, like us as a manufacturer who has products that they would like to list on it? Sure. So our, our website is Amerify.io. And it's extremely user-friendly website. You could go on to the website. We have a, a red button that said that says get listed. You type in your information and within a day or so, we'll have someone from our team reach out to you, send you a easy Excel spreadsheet for you guys to fill out, send it back. And within another day or two, your products will be on the site. Ultimately, we're working and we'll, we'll roll this out in a few months where you'll be able to register and handle everything online. You'll be able to have a username and password so that if you're a, a manufacturer, you'll be able to log into your account, add, modify, do whatever you need to your products without the need of interfacing with any of uh, the Amerified staff. And it's all free right now, I should say. The best part is for, for all users, manufacturers, architects, engineers, contractors, subcontractors, it's free to log on, see all the products that are on the site. And it's also free to for manufacturers to put the products on. We really want to make the, the database as comprehensive as possible and get products from all project types and from manufacturers all over the, the country. Well, and that was what really impressed me as I learned about was the fact that, yeah, right now you're doing this completely for free. And because, uh, you know, as a manufacturer, there are lots of databases out there we can list our products on and they get pretty pricey real quick. And, you know, but they are not USA made databases either. So here you are doing something very specific. So uh, I certainly applaud you for that. Well, you know, Brian, I have to say you're obviously an ambitious young guy. Um you know, you, here you are, you saw opportunity in this, uh, what we consider to be a great field, great industry of real estate development, construction, um, and then you brought in the transportation piece and, uh, you know, you've pursued it with gusto. Um, what advice would you have for younger folks, um, other younger folks who are pursuing their dreams uh, in construction or, or really in any field? I mean, you, you, you saw something, you made it happen. Um, how can you inspire others to do that too? Uh, first, well, first of all, you have to enjoy what you're doing. Um, and if you enjoy it and you're willing to put the time in and be persistent and keep your head down and put the work in, the good things happen and prepare for for meetings and take everything seriously and don't take it for granted you i think you'll set yourself up for for success wow good advice good advice well thank you so much brian this has been really fascinating um we're actually close to wrapping up what we call sort of the business end of things here on the show is, is there anything we haven't covered about Brightline or Amerified um, that you'd like to share with our audience? 
No, this is this has been great, and I invite both you, Todd, and and Ethan, down to Florida to see Brightline for yourselves yeah. and to tell your friends about it. And then for all the manufacturers and architects, you, I know you, this there's a large uh, listener base. I invite you all to go check out Amerify.io and register and look forward to um, our continued conversation. Well, that's good stuff. And I, yes, I am going to be there. I'm looking forward to riding on a bright line train, uh, hopefully before too long. Well, before we do close up, I have to ask if you're willing to participate in something uh, here on the show we call our rapid fire round. So uh, rapid fire consists of seven questions. They may be, some are serious, some are silly. Um, all you have to do is give an answer to each. So I um, have to ask, are you up to the challenge of rapid fire? Of course. Can't say no to that. Yeah. Well, no one ever has. I'm not sure what we'd do if they did, so <laughs> I'm glad of that. Well, well, we will ask you these seven questions. We will alternate. Um, Ethan, I'll let you take the first one if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So can you think of a product that you purchased recently that's been kind of a game changer for you? Sort of like, where's this been all my life? You know, something like that. Yeah, so we, my wife and I recently had another baby, and with that Congratulations. came... Thank you. Congrats. With that um, comes the purchase of a sound machine and just absolutely helped the baby sleep, drowned out some of the noise, and any sleep that the baby gets is that much better for us. So I'll say gotcha. a, a good quality sound machine. Oh, wow. So that just creates like white noise or background <laughs> noise or. Ex exactly. And then drown out the, the other kids. So, you know, <laughs> makes it easy. Uh, fantastic. Well, congratulations again on the baby, and I'm glad to hear that sound machine is working. That makes it a little bit easier, yeah. too. So question number two, uh, would you rather have the ability to see 10 minutes into the future or 10 years into the future? I'll take uh, 10 minutes okay. into the future. I don't want to see too far down. That, that's that's yeah. That's what someone else said. Yeah. Once. And I don't know if I want that responsibility of seeing yeah. that far out. Yeah, <laughs> we get in, and get into some good sports betting too with ten minutes. So, uh, yeah, good indeed. Yeah. Good deal. All right, next one. What's your uh, favorite meal? It's a uh, simple pizza. Mm. Good choice. Uh, yeah. Can't go wrong. Question number four, I think. Um, do you have a bucket list vacation that you look forward to taking someday? I would love to take the kids to Australia, kids and wife to Australia. Cool. Have you been there? I have been there. Okay. Now you got to take the family. Good yeah. deal. All righty. Next one. If you had an extra hour every day, how would you spend it? Uh, I would spend it working out. I like to work out and don't always have the time or make the time. So that's certainly, if I had a dedicated hour, that, that's what I would use it for. Nice. Good answer. Next to last, so far it's been pretty painless. Um, this one's a fun one though. If you had to eat a crayon, what color of crayon would you choose to eat? Probably orange. Ooh. Okay. And hope it would taste like an orange. Assuming it would taste <laughs> like, yeah, it won't. But <laughs> You know, good, good luck with that. Yeah, I think it would be fun to get a really bright one, something like a bright green or a periwinkle blue or something, just to stain your teeth as much as possible. <laughs> <you know? laughs> All right, last question. Who is one person who's had a big impact on your life, and how have they had that impact? Uh, my father. So he just, his, his work ethic, persistence, how he's been able to juggle his profession and, and family, it's been a great model to to follow. That's great. Yeah. That is awesome. Great. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. And what a role model that creates for you as a father, too. Certainly. Uh, trying to be doing that same thing. So yeah. that's cool stuff. Hey, this has been great. So I need to report to our audience that we were all successful on working in our challenge words. So good job, guys. Um, Ethan, you had the word. I had periwinkle, which... Took me a while to get it in there, but I got it in there right at the end. So <laughs> I like to do that sometimes. Yeah, good job. Uh, Brian, your word was? It was cavalier. And you worked it in seamlessly. Yeah. I had the word inflation, which, uh, so good job, guys. We all got our challenge words in there. I let well, you out. Too easy. That, that was too easy of a word. <laughs> well, someday I'm going to give someone something like 
colitis or constipation or something like that and revert back to the fourth grade Todd or something. I don't know. But anyway, well, Brian, thank you so much. Um, this has been a pleasure for folks who would want to get in touch with you or um, folks who maybe want to see that schedule for Brightline because they're planning a trip to Florida. Um, what are some easy ways for them to, uh, to do that? Yeah. So for, for Brightline, we've got a great website. It's the website's gobrightline.com. And all the, anything you need is on the website there. And for Amerified, the website is amerified.io. All we have uh, get listed and contact page there. So make it really easy for you to get in touch with us. Very good. And we will put that information in the show notes as well. So folks can look for it there too. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much, Brian. This has been great. I enjoyed our time together and uh, keep up the great work on everything. Thank you, Todd and Ethan. Yeah. It was, it was fun. Well, and thank you to our audience for tuning into this episode of Construction Disruption with Brian Cronberg of Brightline Trains and also Amerified. Just to make that clear, it's A-M-E-R-I-F-I-E-D, Amerified. Okay, and that's Amerified.io, is that right? Correct. Yep, good deal. So um, please watch for future episodes of our podcast. We always have great guests. Um, don't forget to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or YouTube. Um, until the next time to, we're together, though, keep on disrupting, keep on challenging uh, yourself and uh, those around you to better ways of doing things. And don't forget to have a positive impact on everyone you encounter. Make them smile and encourage them. Uh, simple yet powerful things we can all do every day. So God bless and take care. This is Isaiah Industries signing off. And until the next episode of Construction Disruption. This podcast is produced by Isaiah Industries, manufacturer of specialty metal roofing and other building products.